Fixing CARICOM, regional leaders gather in Montego Bay, Jamaica to chart a way forward. Weekend Business Report starts right now. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Keneal Gale. Thanks for joining us this week. Critical issues such as trade, the Caribbean Single Market and Economy, CSME, and the Caribbean Court of Justice, CCJ, were high on the agenda at the 39th CARICOM Heads of Government meeting, which ended in Montego Bay on Friday. We'll have more on that in a bit, but right now, let's take a look at some of the news stories about how the Petrojam saga continued to unfold this week. Cabinet has decided to relieve Dr. Andrew Wheatley of his duties as Energy Minister due to ongoing investigations at Petrojam. The former Energy, Technology and Mining Minister will now hold the post Minister of Technology and Mining. Jamila Maitland reports. Energy portfolio is expected to be transferred to the office of the Prime Minister come July 4. The decision comes after weeks of public outcry to remove Dr. Wheatley after revelations of alleged mismanagement of funds at the state-owned oil refinery Petrojam. In a press release, Cabinet explained that Petrojam requires strategic review of its management and operations, as well as its long-term commercial viability and the role it plays in Jamaica's energy security. It continued to say that Minister Wheatley and Prime Minister Andrew Holness agreed that it would be best to remove himself from the post to offer greater transparency during the ongoing investigations. But Dr. Wheatley is expected to continue his duties as Technology and Mining Minister. Additionally, Cabinet decided that residential status of nominated board members must be submitted to the Cabinet for approval. Overseas travel for chairmen or board directors must also be approved by the Minister. The list goes on to outline that public bodies are prohibited from entering into retainer contract without Cabinet's approval and donations being made as corporate social responsibility must be submitted to Petrojam's management for approval. If the quota is passed, the minister must be alerted for his approval. The Ministry of Finance is tasked with developing these regulations. These decisions come after several cases of alleged mismanagement, breaches in procurement guidelines and alleged cronyism and nepotism at Petrojam. Meanwhile, Cabinet has announced that a special enterprise team will be assembled to conduct and oversee the organizational and strategic review of Petrojam. Wheatley must go, that is the sentiment from the opposition and at least one business leader, Javon Keyes, tells us more. Wrong move. That's how the Opposition People's National Party is describing Prime Minister Andrew Holness's decision to yank the energy portfolio from Dr. Andrew Wheatley. They wanted the Prime Minister to go further. In a statement, the PNP said it rejected the decision, calling it a slap on the wrist which is a little too late. The party wants Dr. Wheatley to be fired from the Holness cabinet. In the meantime, Executive Director of the National Integrity Action NIA, Professor Trevor Monroe, said the corruption watchdog is not satisfied with the action taken by the Prime Minister as it goes against the commitment he made to the nation. This measure that has been taken to remove the energy section of the portfolio of Minister Wheatley while retaining him as a minister falls short of the Prime Minister's own commitment at his inauguration. It falls short of the requirements of ministerial responsibility as set out very clearly in the Code of Conduct for Ministers, which states that Ministers of Government must behave according to the highest standards of constitutional and personal conduct in the performance of their duties. The action taken falls very short of that. The Prime Minister is letting himself down, he's letting down the nation, and he should correct that as quickly as possible. He said it is unacceptable, especially since there have been cases over the years where portfolio ministers have stepped aside under similar circumstances. Meanwhile, the president of the private sector organization of Jamaica PSOJ, Howard Mitchell, said the overarching issue is a lack of governance and the action taken by Prime Minister Honus against Dr. Wheatley cannot solve this. The PSOJ is not sure that we are focusing on the fundamental problem, which is a lack of governance and an apparent inability to manage governance 
in the ministry. We are not confident that the steps taken to remove the energy portfolio or section of the portfolio from Dr. Wheatley would be addressing the root cause of the problem in the ministry. He said now is the time for the establishment of performance criteria for members of the cabinet and putting procedures of governance on the table for all public sector bodies. He also thinks Minister Wheatley should step aside. I would hope that a review of the management of the ministry would take place. But in the meantime, that uh, Dr. Wheatley would step back from the portfolio entirely um, until that review is complete and an assessment made of his performance as minister. And the president of the Jamaica Manufacturers and Exporters Association, JMEA, Matrisiaga, said he understands the decision made by the prime minister. He also notes that his organization eagerly awaits the outcome of the investigations and they hope appropriate actions will be taken against the parties to be blamed. And Dr. Andrew Wheatley finally faced the music in parliament on Tuesday. He provided answers to months-old questions posed by several opposition members regarding Petrojam. Questions range from the vacuum distillation unit to the awarding of contracts, the $12.2 million human resource manager's salary, and the chairman's $8,000 US dollar travel reimbursement. Addressing the concerns about the HR manager's salary, Dr. Wheatley outlined the qualifications of the current holder of the position. These skills include, but are not limited to Mr. Speaker, knowledge, experience, and certification in global talent management and competence modeling framework, knowledge and experience in current HR technology and information systems, knowledge, training, and certification in Lean Six Sigma methodologies to support process improvements across respective business units, broad knowledge of strategies to improve and or exceed customer experience and support brand strategies, expertise with the implementation and alignment of learning, and development strategies to support and achieve key performance indicators and keen understanding of HR strategic business strategies. Minister Wheatley said such requirements are crucial to both the private and the public sector, which Petrojam's previous HR manager lacked. He added that the remuneration was approved by the Ministry of Finance. Regarding donations made by Petrojam, Minister Wheatley listed several groups that the company assisted. However, he pointed out that the details of the donations were not required. I'm advised that Petrojam's existing donation policy, which was created in 2002 under the then administration, does not outline or require that any information relating to the method of donation expenditure be submitted. And that is a, a deficiency that we must address. Yeah, yeah. And the, 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 the Prime Minister, as a, as a matter of fact, the Cabinet um, addressed that matter yesterday. And we'll have more on the Petrojam saga later on in the show. But moving on now, CARICOM leaders held extensive talks this week looking at ways to strengthen regional integration. The region looked on as leaders from CARICOM member states took their seats on the stage at the opening ceremony of the 39th CARICOM Heads of Government Conference in Montego Bay, St. James. During his opening address, CARICOM Secretary General Ambassador Erwin LaRocque said he is pleased with Jamaica's Prime Minister Andrew Holness's drive to chair the group. He outlined some of the discussions scheduled to take place. High on the agenda was the much-anticipated discussion about the Caribbean single market and economy CSME. The success of the CSME is being judged by the public on the basis of our implementation of the measures agreed to that allow our citizens and businesses to benefit. This meeting will include a special session on the single market and economy to look at ways of making it more effective. That session will benefit from the views of a stakeholder consultation which I convened last month in Georgetown. Participants at that event confirmed that the CSME remained the most viable option and platform to enable the community and its nationals to achieve their goals of sustainable growth and development. Meanwhile, Ambassador LaRocque acknowledged the report from Jamaica's CARICOM Review Commission, saying he is currently discussing with a group in Guyana other issues that pose a challenge to the CSME. They expressed particular concern about the ease of doing business and the movement of skilled nationals. The participants also lamented the lack of compliance with already agreed measures. 
They stress the need for an enforcement and accountability framework to encourage implementation and compliance. It is one of the issues which features among the recommendations of the report of the Commission to review Jamaica's relations within CARICOM and CARIFORUM frameworks, which is before this meeting. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Holness noted that in the next few months, member states will be rolling out practical programs to enable them to fulfill their obligations under the CSME. In the coming months, we will place special emphasis on those initiatives which have the most potential for streamlining at the national and regional levels. Prime Minister Holness said while the CSME is key to fostering regionalism, the region has failed to functionally establish it. It is my considered view that the single market is a victim of our own reluctance to fully and functionally establish it. As I have often stated, the CSM is the ultimate manifestation of regional integration. Some of its pillars represent the only real means by which our citizens will experience the process of integration. We must therefore, as leaders of this great community, relentlessly pursue the goal of overcoming our implementation deficit. He said the vision of the CSME has not been realized, and so more time will be dedicated to it. In the meantime, Prime Minister of Antigua and Barbuda Gaston Brown said the CSME cannot remain on pause. He argued that CARICOM member states need to recommit to it and work collectively to implement it. The CSME calls for us to move beyond functional cooperation. It calls for the commitment of all. Each of our countries has to commit to and implement free movement of goods, people, services, capital, and technology. It is the only way in which our region will overcome the low level of both interregional industry and interregional trade. For the newest member of the CARICOM Heads of Delegation, Barbados Prime Minister Mia Motley, abandoning the CSME would be a mistake. We do not accept that we should abandon all notions of the single market and the single economy. While we accept that there are practical realities that will preclude harmonious convergence with macroeconomic policies and fiscal policies, we do believe that there is significant room still for us to get with respect to aspects of our economic competitiveness, whether it is in terms of electronic commerce, capital markets integration, food security or other areas that will simply make us more competitive with respect to our productive capabilities than we currently are. With respect to the single market, we need to get the project moving again. She acknowledged that there have been complaints about Barbados's red tape and the country's willingness to facilitate movement of professionals. Our country has been one of those countries that we have heard reflect difficulties with respect to the level of red tape that our region faces. And anyone who knows Barbados well would know that I love the color red, but I do not love red tape. It is self-evident that the matter of accreditation and the issuance and verification of skills certificates has come to humbug too many of our citizens in their day-to-day -day lives. This is of great concern to us. And the Caribbean Court of Justice, CCJ, has a new president. Justice Adrian Dudley Saunders was sworn in as the third president of the Caribbean Court of Justice on Wednesday. In his address, the new president said the court's high standard of judgments passed down over the years should remove any doubt about the region's ability to administer its own laws. It is remarkable and regrettable that there are still some who have a misgivings about the region's capacity to discharge that responsibility in an efficient and effective manner. Over the last 13 years, the Caribbean Court of Justice has demonstrated its mettle. The high caliber of its judgments speaks for itself. Company news comes up next, then later. He's young, talented, and his drawings are mesmerizing the world. We'll tell you about Nigeria's newest art find. More WBR after this break.
Welcome back to Weekend Business Report. Here's this week's company news. King Alarm has been doing damage control. The company removed personnel involved in an altercation that was caught on video. The video raised a slew of concerns about the use of force by the King Alarm security personnel. The altercation involving two men happened on a property at Braemar Avenue in St. Andrew. One of the men, a licensed firearm holder, apparently shot the other who tried to disarm him. However, as the videos continue to make their way around social media, concerns are being raised about the way in which the security personnel from King Alarm Systems handled the situation. The fracker has forced King Alarm to mandate its guards to do human rights training. An initial public offering by Stanley Motor Limited is causing buzz among the local stock exchange investors. The revived real estate company is seeking to raise just over $4 billion by selling 758 million ordinary shares. The offer, which opens on July 6 and closes on July 20th, is priced at Jamaican $5.31 per ordinary share. Stanley Motor is owned and controlled by the Mawson Group and Harbour Street Properties Limited. They are the developer of the 58 Half a Tree Tech Park in Kingston. The Tech Park is the largest B PO facility in the English speaking Caribbean. Let's now take a look at the closing numbers from the major stock markets around the world. When we come back, more stories about the Petrojam saga. Stay with us. Welcome back to Weekend Business Report. An internal audit of the state-owned oil refinery Petrojam found that the company lost billions of dollars due to inefficiencies, uncompetitive contracts, and invoicing errors. BATV News obtained a copy of the report conducted by an auditor from Petrojam's minority owner, Venezuela's PDVSA. Shamila Maitland has the details. The audit finds that Petrojam did not meet its operational target over the two-and-a-half-year period. And although Petrojam did turn a profit over the period, the report notes that that was only because the oil prices were in the company's favor and other external conditions turned out to be beneficial. The audit uncovers major inefficiencies at the refinery caused by outdated technology and worn-out facilities. This led to opportunity losses of nearly 23 million U.S. dollars. Invoicing errors also led to another six million U.S. dollars in losses, while physical losses of product due to things like evaporation cost the company two million U.S. dollars more than estimated. That's a total loss of thirty-one million U.S. dollars or four billion Jamaican dollars. Then there's another three hundred and forty-three thousand U.S. dollars or forty-four million Jamaican dollars spent on seventy thousand barrels of high sulfur diesel at a premium price because it was procured on emergency contracts. However, the emergency product wasn't discharged until nearly a month later. The report says this does not look reasonable. Also damning is a finding that Petrojam spent $14 million on direct and emergency contracts, many of which should have gone to competitive tender. That's 210 emergency contracts and over 2,000 awarded by direct contracting. Among the goods, services, or works that were directly contracted and which exceeded the threshold are consulting services for public relations, project management and industrial relations, laundry services, printing services, and even gifts for children of the employees. There are also things like repair and cleaning for storage tanks, 
purchase of ethanol, and procurement of tools. In all, there were 555 contracts directly awarded, which should have gone to competitive tender. While uh, Petro Jamsen battled the human resource manager Yolanda Ramarak, defended herself before Parliament's Public Administration and Appropriations Committee, PAAC, on Wednesday. Here's more. PAAC members grilled Petro Jam's human resource manager Yolanda Ramharak for her $12.2 million annual salary. Ms. Ramharak explained that the job description did not require a master's degree in HR, but an equivalent which she possesses. For the job description, the job description does indicate that the qualification is an MBA or equivalent qualifications. I do have a certification, a graduate certification, and I'm at least more than halfway or halfway to earning my MBA currently. PAAC members pointed out that when Ms. Ramharak started the job in February 2017, she was at the lower rank in the six to nine million dollars band, but she quickly moved to $13 million when benefits were included in just two months. Ms. Ramharak says she came with skills that the previous manager didn't have. The hiring decision for my position included someone who would be an employee champion, would possess business acumen, culture, and a strategic positioner. All of those that I did demonstrate the ability to execute on and engagement as well. Ms. Ramharak says she started a wellness program at Petrojam for employees where employees were going through depression which affected the productivity of the company. So prior to me getting there at Petrojam, there have been reports from the team members that have been suffering from bouts of de depression based on what has been happening at the organization. So our formal wellness strategy, which has been implemented since the start of this year, also includes the assistance with the EAP, Employee Assistance Program, that we do have with a counselor Yes, and we are measuring those interventions as we speak. So not that Petrojam was not doing something, but it was not a structured process. And so we now have a formal wellness strategy. GM and HR must go. That was one of the chants by employees of Petrojam as they called for the resignation of their general manager and human resource manager on Thursday. The call comes in light of alleged corruption and several issues affecting the state-owned oil refinery. Behind me is the scene of Petrojam Limited where employees have worn black in protest of the current situations happening at the state-owned government entity. The employees want General Manager Floyd Grindley and Human Resource Manager Yolan Ramharak to resign over alleged mismanagement of the company. The employees were upset about comments made at Parliament's Public Administration and Appropriations Committee, PAAC, yesterday, claiming they're distressed and depressed. On handwritten placards hiding their faces, the workers claimed that those were lies. General Secretary of the Union of Clerical Administrative and Supervisory Employee, UK's John Levy, spoke on their behalf. Those comments are not in keeping with what they know, and we're speaking specifically to the issue of depression levels of the staff. It's totally out of order for those comments to be made in the public space. Right? These are matters that are private and confidential, and no, even in a semblance of making reference to any depression of staff. Should, because what it does is that it labels and it places a stigma on the workers down here. According to Mr. Levy, the employees are unaware of an employee satisfaction survey done in 2015 which claims more than 60% of employees are satisfied. The workers are not aware of that survey being done. They are not aware of any results being provided of that survey. And to the best of my knowledge, the management did respond yesterday when inquiries were made of them that they are also not aware of the survey. So I don't know if it was a kind of a mystery shop arrangement that, that took place. So the workers also wanted the public to know that they are not aware of any survey. And as a matter of fact, and I mean it is plain to see this morning that the, the, the moral of the staff, the motivation is, is even worse than that 35% 
without any scientific backing of, of my comments. The General Secretary says the workers have indicated that they want better management to steer the nationally important institution. Mr. Levy says employees don't even know who's in charge of the organization as they've received no correspondence from the ministry. He says they only learned that Petrogem will be governed by the office of the Prime Minister through the media. We don't know if it is the Prime Minister, if it is one of the ministers in the Prime Minister's office. That has not been spoken to us yet, but we believe that it is important now that we get around the table before this thing gets out of hand. When we come back, we'll introduce you to one of Nigeria's youngest art geniuses, more WBR after the break. Welcome back to Weekend Business Report. He's only 11 years old, but his drawings are already capturing the attention of the world, with many saying he could be the art world's next big thing. When people see his lifelike works of art, they find it hard to believe that Waris Karim is only 11 years old. He started selling his drawings when he was eight. Waris spends hours sketching his models. But there's no patients coming through. I probably lose my answer. Wari says he's also inspired by his country, Nigeria, and the difficulties many face here. Everybody in my sight has lived on all my streets. They struggle, struggle, they sweat for their eats. Artist Adenei Adewale teaches youngsters in this Lagos courtyard. He says Wari is his most gifted student. You can go far far than even beyond our expectation. I used to tell him that don't see yourself like a roadside artist. Believe you can be like, you can, you can have a name like Michelangelo's, like Da Vinci. Waris Karim says he hopes one day his work will be displayed in international museums. Judging by the stunning quality of his art, it's a dream that could come true quite soon. And that's our show for this week. On behalf of the entire Weekend Business Support team, I'm Keneal. See you next time. <laughs>